Welcome to Crafty Sourcer. If you're looking for a raw, unfiltered podcast on all things sourcing in APAC, you've come to the right place. Grab a coffee or wine and join your host and other guests as we dive deep into the complex and ever-evolving world of sourcing, keeping you informed on insights, tools, and even at times, a healthy sourcing debate or two. Now, here's your host, Denise Pereira from Kaleidosource. Settle in and let's get crafty. Hi, everyone. We are back with another episode of Crafty Sosa. Like so many amazing folks in our community, Steve Prince is someone who has quietly been flying under the radar, and he knows I keep picking on him for that. But he absolutely packs a punch when it comes to sharing his thoughts around sourcing and the grind it takes to source or to be a good sourcer. We are going to be touching on a few themes here within certain topics that are crucial, but also controversial. So we're going to get into it. Let's get crafty. Steve, welcome. Thank you so much, Denise. It is, it is a genuine pleasure to be here. Thank you. Now, I'm, I'm just really happy that you finally said yes to, to coming on, <laughs> on to the podcast, because I remember I was chasing you for a little while and I was like, hmm, I don't know if this guy likes podcasting or not, but I'm so glad that we've you know connected and we've stayed in touch in it for these past few months. Now, Steve, before we get into our chat, obviously, there are people that may know you, there are people that don't. Quick intro for our listeners. Who is Steve and what makes you tick in DA? Steve is someone who has been doing sourcing for about 20 years now, about 19 years. To answer the most obvious question first, the answer is fell into it, answered Nat on <laughs> Seek, didn't know what a sourcer was, just went, yeah, okay, no worries. Looks like the skills that I've got. Somehow got the job and somehow kind of kept getting jobs. In terms of my experience, I have kind of done it, like I looked around and I kind of did an assessment and I kind of worked out I've done almost everything you can do as a sourcer in that at the moment I'm working in-house. I've worked for a big four consultancy. I've run my own business. I've worked in executive search. I've worked in business consultancy and I've worked in agency as well. You know, that's kind of where I'm at. Um, have worked in uh, Australia, the UK, the US. The only continent I have not yet sourced for is Antarctica. So if someone knows anyone doing the Antarctic, the Australian Antarctic expedition, if they need sourcing, please, like I just want to tick that one off. If you, you know? want to source for penguins, then please get in touch with Steve. <laughs> exactly. They have their own tuxedos, very well dressed. I mean, it's it's really fascinating because you're one of, if you look at your background, you're one of the the key players in our community who start sourcing when a lot of people didn't even know how to spell sourcing or what it actually was. So you've seen the evolution and the transformation of what sourcing was, what it is, and possibly what it's going to become with, with Gen AI. We've also spent a lot of time talking about this. We've seen heaps of LinkedIn posts that are debates on this topic. You've been in the sourcing game for a very, very long time. So I'd love to get your perspective on this is, Passive talent identification and engagement. What have you seen in your years of experience, the difference between it versus classic recruiting that we all know it to be mm. as? So first of all, for those of you who are in audio, as Denise was giving me that very kind rap, I was just sitting here blushing and couldn't really kind of blanked out. But to answer the question, there's, there's two sides to it. One is if we look at what I've seen, you know, I came up in 2004 the uh, 2004, 2000, 2005, I think it was. Someone can correct me by looking at my LinkedIn, absolutely. And that was before LinkedIn really had hit Australia. Um, I think I joined in about October 2005. So the key aspect of this is what I'm getting towards is when I started in the industry and sourcing, it was very much around personal relationships. It was very much around making phone calls. It was what we come to know as the dark arts. And I'm not necessarily talking about Voldemort, but what I am talking about is, you know, you'd call a company, be like, um, hi, um, I'm looking, I'm hosting a function and I'd love to talk to your head of sales. Yeah. And can I get the spelling for that, please? Okay, great, thanks. And then you kind of go from there. So it was very much phone dependent. Then we moved to LinkedIn and from about 2005 to about 2007, we had a really weird situation where people kind of were on LinkedIn, but didn't really appreciate that people would actually contact them. So it was kind of like if they put their details up on the local, you know, 
whiteboard at the supermarket and then we're kind of like, well, why are you calling me? And you're like, well, because you put your, your details up. I'm like, okay, fine. And I think uniquely, Australia is uniquely positioned in that for us, more broadly speaking than the US or, or, or the European markets, we seem to find it more, uh, let's say, intrusive mm-hmm. that, that, that people find our details and, and contact us. And so, and, and, and I, I think the mentality is there at the executive level where people are looking at sea levels, they're going, yeah, okay, I'm used to getting calls from headhunters. But, you know, when you're talking to someone about, say, a 2IC role at a JJ's or a, a, a jeans company, for example, you're kind of like, well, how did you find my name? I'll call the store and ask for you. So that's that bracket. And then we noticed that that it kind of slides into LinkedIn becoming more accepted, much like we saw during that time. I mean, this is why everyone's great aunt is on Facebook posting memes about how the government's going to take away their cash or something like that. It's it's very much structured around acceptance. So we kind of breach the wall of resistance, then we get to acceptance. Now, the exciting thing about the industry, we're seeing the post-LinkedIn world happen, and it's playing out on LinkedIn, which is, to your point, the, the conversation around around generative AI. I'm more an optimist than a lot of my colleagues in this space. Generative AI, I think, is going to make the biggest impact for those recruiters who have spent the last five, 10 years doing simple transaction work. If I would be scared if I didn't have the capacity to do passive uh, passive candidate attraction, if I didn't understand or have the key skills to reach out and engage with candidates, if my job was to simply put an ad up on a job service board and then manage responses, yes, you congratulations, you have a target on your back. Be scared. Fear should not be the driver, though. The, the opportunity is learn. The opportunity is get to grips with the AI. We have a lot of debates, for those of you who missed the champagne conversation that we have in the sourcing community around, you have one side saying, AI is the solution to all our problems and here's my skill set and it'll cost you, you know, fourteen ninety nine every month to get it. And we have those who are saying AI is just a bulldozer and a wrecking ball that is going to come in and, and all recruiting is over and it's just going to be AI. I believe it's not, we're not looking at an extinction level event for recruiting. We are looking at an evolution event. So as a consequence, our key skills, and and the conversation is shifting already and has been shifting for the last few years. The conversation has moved from, especially in sourcing, from find me these people for this role. Its sources are not and should not be order takers. It should not be a case of, I need to find five people to fill this job. Okay, great. You know, that's, that is, a recruiter can do that. That's, that's not where sourcing adds value. Where sourcing adds value, specifically with passive candidate attraction, is finding and engaging with people. It is not transactional. It is relationship building. And I think that's where a lot of people are grinding up against is that idea of, well, I want to, I, I just simply want to build my business on doing 500 transactions or, or, or what have you. And it's, yeah. we're seeing the evolution of the relationship where people and, and businesses themselves are not looking for a transactional recruiter. Yeah. You know, we've, we've been striving to come out of the shadows and be a trusted advisor. How do we do that? Well, we actually engage with our clients and say, look, I understand the challenges you're looking to do, and here's the data to back it up. So what I would advise, and apologies for your listeners if I'm going off on 14 different tangents at once, but I'll try and do something relatively It's just your passion for the community, Steve. Keep going. Thank you. Is <laughs> the, the skills I would advise people to get is, is data and data communications, data intelligence. So you're looking at building dashboards, you're looking at Tableau, you're looking at um, Power BI kind of how do you so how do you measure that? And and that's as you step into AI, as you step into generative AI, okay, that's great that you can press a button and get five thousand results. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. And you can you can you can cycle that down from five thousand to five hundred and fifty to whatever. You still need that pull factor. You still need that that ability to communicate what is the... And if your message is being driven by AI that sends targeted messages, generally that's going to go in spam. Generally, like passive candidates specifically are not looking for opportunities. They are happy at their jobs. They will tell you this. And the concept there is they need to be brought into the process rather than just go, well, you know, I'm working for Company X, so you should just apply because it's Company X. And I, I've worked with brands where that has been their talent attraction process is, is kind of like, well, we are Company X, so why wouldn't people apply to us? 
of course. Why, why wouldn't you? Um, and that creates a lot of issues when you try to get them to understand that the market has moved on from that level of attraction. That that's that's very much late eighties, early nineties, and certainly you haven't seen that since early thousands. Where the market is now is. In case people haven't noticed, we have a cost of living crisis. Mm. And this might shock people. So for those of you listening at home, you might want to take a seat. People want jobs. People want a paycheck. Ideally, something that pays more than where they're currently at. Reward in terms of remuneration is no longer a dirty factor. It's no longer a... A, 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 a red a, flag. A, a red flag, thank you. It, it is about shaping that co- that community and, and that kind of conversation of, well, okay, well, that is certainly one factor, but it is an important factor. People have bills to pay. Mm. People have a mortgage. People have rent. So you need to be able to say to them, guess what? We are actually offering you, as part of this growth opportunity, part of the growth is tied to salary. So I think the days of looking at negatives of, well, this person wants you know, more money or this person wants a different title or whatever, or, or oh, God forbid, they've got a gap in their CV. You know, I, I think that conversation is starting to evolve into, okay, well, what transferable skills does this person have and how can we attract them in? Because the days, and, and this is where AI is, is, is coming in at an interesting time, mm-hmm. we are seeing a shift in our markets to recruiting for skills based, for recruiting for competency rather so than titles. As a consequence, what happens is the ability to title match by pressing a button doesn't give anyone rewards anymore. It doesn't pay off. What the payoff is, is how do we interpret the skills and how do we get people to say, here are my skills, here is what I can do. Because a lot of people, if you're a project manager, your brain goes, I'm a project manager, that is what I do, thank you very much. But you're not necessarily looking and considering the skills that you have that can be transferable into admin, operations, Mm. sales, what have you. And, and vice versa. And there is a lot of issues coming around the fact that hiring managers aren't necessarily trained to hire. They're trained to go, well, you're a people leader. So as a consequence, you need five people. Go out and find five people. So they go, well, I know exactly what I want. I want people who can do this exact job because that's the job that I did five years ago. And that's where I want them. So that's what I will look for. I feel like that's like maybe anywhere between 30 to 50% of the problem in hiring in general is that Hiring managers are, like to your point, they're put into a leadership role because they've obviously done well. However, they don't know how to hire. And this is where training should be there. And I also feel like training should not be a one-off. It should be at least every six months. It should be around biasness. It should be around diversity. It should be around some really crucial things because these are all parts and parcel of what we do when we're interviewing candidates, right? Look, exactly. I mean, my core proposition, and apologies, I've, I've wandered so far away from the initial okay. question. My core proposition with sourcing is people generally think of one of four things when they think of sourcing. They think of sourcing passive talent. So find me people for a job. They think of developing talent pipelines and talent pools. You know, we have this reoccurring job that we need to filled. So find me 100 people who can do this job and we'll just work our way through them and cycle through them. Then it's competitive intelligence of we work at bank X, we want to find out what banks Y, Z, A, and B are doing. And then they think of occasionally, they think of ATS organization. So ATS, applicant tracking system, for those of you who don't know, but I think everyone in your audience should. And where that comes into play with sourcing is things like tags and how you classify your data. So that's one of four things that people generally think of. Where people miss and and what I kind of want to boost the signal of are things like counterintelligence of if you have someone leaving, what are they saying about the market? If I'm interviewing someone as a as a passive talent, what are their perceptions of the company I work for? How do I communicate that? Because if if my company has a great reputation, I want to be able to communicate that to the stakeholders and say, here, here is what your hidden value is. You know, the other thing we're looking at is succession planning is going and I think I talked about this on Aiden's Aiden's podcast a week or so ago. But if we cast our mind back to a certain fruit and vegetable supplier where their CEO went on and was interviewed and didn't have such a great interview, and by Thursday they'd come out and they'd said, "Congratulations, he's already told us he's going to retire and he's our, he's their successor." I'm just curious as to whether that was 
development process, or if that was an, oh God, oh God, we need to, to demonstrate to the market we have change, oh God. So as a consequence, yeah. where sourcing adds value is proactive succession planning, is yeah. the ability to go, if someone wins the lottery or gets hit by a bus or goes on a national syndicated you know, um, interview and then just boffs it, well then this is how we actually plan for their yeah. change. And the last thing is d strategy. So where that becomes relevant is looking at the market and going, if we have key opportunities, and just one second, sorry, if we have key opportunities that really need to expand our talent pipeline to certain underrepresented sectors, how do we do that? Well, we do that by doing proactive talent identification and assessment and reaching out to them. You know, we do that by growing the leaders of tomorrow today. We do that by giving people who would be, you know, just another CV, we go out and we assess them, we talk to them, we build those bridges and those relationships yeah. so when the time is right and relevant for both sides, we can have key conversations. You've made some very, very crucial points and I'm glad that, you know, there are people in our community that understand sourcing but not just sticking to one facet of it because there's so many, you know, add-ons to, to what it is we do. And it still amazes me that we struggle to sometimes get it right. I mean, this is such a critical thing. However, it's always seen as the stepchild to some extent. I mean, hiring is only taken seriously when they have to hire and candidate pipeline management, nourishing and nurturing those relationships are not seen as important as other parts of the process, which obviously ties into candidate experience. One of the things you spoke about and I was writing notes was phone calls. And Yes, I've been an agency, but I've been more an internal recruiter. And I don't know why people always have this concept or this thought process that picking up the phone is a very agency thing to do. No, it's not. You want to still get onto a phone. If you're using tools like Hire Easy, which gives you both contact details, email and phone numbers, how quick do you want a response back? Do you want to pick up the phone and get a yes or no from them? Or do you want to just send out 50 emails in hopes that, you know, 20 are going to reply back and you're going to take them to the process and make a hire from that? I don't know why nowadays I've heard and I've seen and I've had conversations with people who are like, yeah, I don't think I want to pick up the phone and give them a call. I'll send them an email. Why are we not diversifying our platforms and channels to engage with people as well? That was one thing that came out. The other thing that also you said about was the evolution of AI and the ones who are skeptics and it's okay to be skeptical will run from it, but also be curious about it because it is here. It is, it's not going to take our jobs or whatever people are saying, but how can we actually embrace it and be part and parcel of this evolution that's happening? So if I, if I looked into my crystal ball, I can pretty much predict what's going to happen with AI. Feel free to absolutely carpet me in 12 months time. I'm wildly <laughs> wrong. Netflix is the answer. And, and, and by this, what I mean is, let me expand, mm. is that what happens is we saw something come out that totally revolutionized the industry. And then once people worked out how to make a profit off it, it immediately segmented. And that's why we all have 17 different apps now that only have certain select shows. So I think how that's going to manifest in sourcing is going to be, and I think I post this on someone else's thing. I'm like, if you wanted to, if you wanted to do this particular service, congratulations, you have to use this particular AI. If you want to do this, it does that, and so on. So you want to screen 500 CVs, you have to use this one. If you want to integrate your SAP and your calendar and your ATS and everything else, you have to use this, and so on and so forth. I think what it absolutely is going to do will be to segment and really splinter, and we're not going to see one and this is why i don't believe i genuinely do not believe that that ai will be the death of recruiting i think it will be an evolution of recruiting i think the people who will be most exposed to the death will be those people who simply view it as transactional and simply work in high volume roles that can be automated yeah. you know there, there, there is an absolute exposure risk there and to them, I would say, broaden your skill set, look to move internally, you know, look to to influence with data rather than just putting an ad up going, all right, great, here's 10 responses. Great, that's my pipeline. You know, it's shifting the conversation. And I think also the other thing is, is and, and returning a little bit is to your point about the phone calls, how, how we've kind of come to this point. I always ask myself two questions when I'm presenting you always imagine that your stakeholder is going to ask one of one of two things. One, and 
and two, so what? What I'm saying is, is if you're talking to a stakeholder and you go, I've sent out 50 emails, and just imagine going, and so what? Like, what's next? What's your plan? I, I worked for a, um, a really great agency a while back, and one of the founders, and, and his point was, hope is not a plan. You know, it's it's not enough just to fling out messages and then go, well, <laughs> I've contacted 50 people. My KPI, my KPI was contact 50 people. Good on me. I've done my KPI. Job done. Feet up. No problems. We have a bias in the industry because we use things like LinkedIn, et cetera, for so long. We're so used to it. We're used to sending emails. We're used mm-hmm. to just going, great, I've sent you an email, so I'm waiting for your response. Not everyone is used to replying to them. Not everyone sees all the messages. Not everyone is as responsive. So what yeah. I would advise people to do in that regard Guard is absolutely send out emails, but then call reception or call their, their mobile or what have you, and then go, hey, I'm just following up on my, my email. Did you get it? Did you want to talk? A, a quick no is better than a nothing. 100% agree with you. And, and look, it's always good to put the ball in the candidate's court. Like, you know, if you have their contact details, maybe send them a text message, ask them, you know, when is a good time to connect with them or do they prefer getting an email? Always give them that option as well. Steve, you make some really important points over here. And I think one thing I will say and add on to that is the fact that people need to also remember that you don't just bring in talent sourcing because you think it's going to be a quick fix and it's going to be your answer to every hiring problem that you've ever had. That's the other thing. Just moving on, Steve, from there, let's talk a little about something that I know you're quite passionate about as well now. I am a big fan of outbound sourcing, recruitment, marketing, call it what you want. I do also believe brand matters when it comes to using LinkedIn in-mails. So if you're Mm -hmm. like a Canva, Google, Meta, that automatically 50% warrants and gets a response. If I'm a brand that is flying under the radar, really depending on how I phrase my message, and if it doesn't sound like every other in-mail that someone is getting, I obviously won't get a response. If you have a well-known brand, what's your take on improving in-mail response rates for those that solely use LinkedIn or LinkedIn Recruiter for their outreach efforts? Quick version on this is it's really simple regardless of brand. Your message should have three key aspects. Who is the person who is sending this? Why are they sending this? When can we talk about the details? So as a consequence, what I'm saying is, is I shouldn't be, if I'm working for, and I'll pick a company I've never worked for, and God bless them, if I'm saying I'm Steve Prince from Pitch, apologies to everyone listening from Pitch, I mean, no disrespect, you know, I'm saying, hi, I'm calling from Peter, I, I'm reaching out from Pitch, this is the area in which I'm working, I've, I see your skills have done X, Y, Z, this is why I think it is relevant, when can we talk about this further? Um, you always want to end with a closed question, you don't want to say, is this of interest, or would you like to click a link, because they'll just go, no, and move on. Call to action, yeah. You know, you, you really want to put the, the ball, to your point, on, in their court of, I want to talk to you. When can we talk? That's that's it. Um, in terms of length of message, longer messages can be more relevant if they have commensurate detail. If it's just a, here is basically the job description reposted and click send, that does not drive engagement at all and you're wasting everyone's time. As a candidate, Steve, if you were to be reached out by another recruiter or a hiring manager that is looking to hire, what would pick your interest? Like what would be an ideal sort of email message sent out to you where it would be like, even though I'm not looking, I'm still fascinated by what, what this company is doing or what the role is. Two things. One, if I'm talking about the company side of it, I want to know. So in that message, I would talk about, here's what we're doing. And I, what I would add here is here we are doing, X innovation, or we are we are growing, we are changing, we are adapting, we are, you know, give people something that is not just hello, please join, go to our careers, mm. whatever. If I'm looking at a personal level, so for those of you um, who have scanned my um, my LinkedIn profile, I talk about Boolean searches and hot sources. I actually had someone the other day message me and be like, hey, look, I can't talk much about hot source, but I'd love to talk about Boolean strings. Okay, bang, my ears are up. I'm not even, you know, I'm, I'm quite comfortable in my, in my job, everything else, but my ears are up because that automatically shows you've actually customized your message to me. 100%. For those that don't know, Steve is actually running a Ask Me Anything session on the LinkedIn community. I believe it's on the 25th uh, of May. Steve, correct me if I'm wrong. I will just check those details because I will have to get back on it because I remember, I know it's somewhere, but I will let you know. And it's all around bullion strings. So... If anyone's listening to this, we will share 
the link around signing up for that as well. Definitely get on to it. You want to hear from Steve. You want to hear what he's doing differently. It's May the 15th. Uh, oh, maybe so, okay, so it's next week. All right. Yes. Maybe we it won't get to them on time, but I'll definitely share the link that I've signed up for. A little controversial here. And I've had a few very interesting conversations around this. Now we're going to unpack our take on people with little to no background in recruiting or talent sourcing that are building tech for us. So I had two conversations about two and a half weeks ago. One person was said, actually, I like the fact that people not from our industry are coming up with this tech because they have a totally different perspective. Yes, they understand our pain points to a certain extent, but they just see things a lot more differently versus we have a tunnel vision of looking at things in one way. What do you think? What's your take on this around people coming up with tech that have little to no background in, in terms of what we do? And do you actually think they have an appreciation for some of our pain points around that? Well, here's the thing. I can walk into a kitchen and make an omelet, it doesn't mean I'd make it to the same quality as a chef. There is an element, and the, the, the short version, because I'm always conscious of time, is I have no issue with people seeking to disrupt the sourcing space. Where I take umbrage, or umbrage, if you would care, is the issue of people coming in and going, I've got the AI-powered solution. It is fantastic. It has every bell and whistle you every percent. I no, Well, no, I actually haven't worked in sourcing, but I understand the pain points because I've worked in computing and I understand that. And it's only one easy payment of nineteen ninety five every month. Explain to me how, like, before you make the sale, show me that you understand what the industry pain point is. Because what you don't see is it's not about finding people. Half the challenge is closing the gap of hiring time. So as a consequence, what's the biggest issue with hiring time? Engaging with the hiring manager. So that stuff is going on in the background that if I'm looking at a sourcing solution, if I'm laser focused on finding more people, you can't influence that. Frankly, it's wildly presumptuous. I think the other thing that, that comes to mind is, okay, that's great. Your solution works because it goes through a bunch of, of profiles. Well, we've seen that with AI and we've seen that with spiders and we've seen that with crawlers and we've seen that with scrapers and we've seen it and we've seen it and we've seen it. Show me the iteration. Show me what you're doing that's different because here's the thing. I firmly believe we are shifting much more towards data communication, data visualization. So as a consequence, if your sale is I can help you go from, you know, I can help you find the profiles that they don't want you to find. Oh, well, please just go on late night TV and just have an ad with Kevin Trudeau's mega memory. And that's the stuff that they don't want. If your offering can be so summed up with these are the secrets that they don't want you to know. I, I have a healthy level of suspicion for your, your solution, respectfully, because here's the thing. We, we want you to know it. The concept of the hidden amount of candidates, the thousands are hidden. I, that shows to me that you don't really understand how data is classified on Boolean searches. It is there. Now, how LinkedIn works, as everyone knows, is... Um, it depends on who you're connected to. As to your, so, Denise, you and I will have different connections. So you will be able to find candidates that I won't be able to find. Same thing. And for those of you who don't know, Denise and I have worked on searches together where I've been able to, and vice versa, we've been able to each find candidates the other doesn't have access to because the value of LinkedIn is the second and the third level connections of who is connected to who is connected to who. So anyone who is saying, I can disrupt the industry because I understand all about how the IT and all about AI, I'm fundamentally alert to. I, I wish them every success. But again, the thing I come back to with the AI solutions is what solution are you trying to solve? Where is where is your solution that you're trying to fix? So as a consequence, what happens is is that if I'm looking at it from a point of view of, oh, I need to find, you know, so many extra people, what let me ask you a question in reserve. How much training have you invested in training your recruiters, your recruiting team. If you have six people recruiting, how, how confident are they in passive candidate identification? How often are they doing it? Or are you just looking for a solve that fixes that? Because that is how you get automated out of business. That is it. That's so true, Steve. And on the flip side of that, and I love this conversation we're having because obviously there are some things that you know people will listen to and be like, hmm, I haven't thought of it like that. Or, oh, I actually don't agree. I'm kind of on the fence about what you're saying. And that's good. We want people to 
you know, listen to this, go to uh, Steve, ask questions, come to me, ask questions, put your questions in the comments. Around the tech side of things, which is one piece of tool or tech that you are using right now that you're really fascinated with and you feel like people in our TA community or sourcing community should absolutely give it a give it a whirl? I knew you'd ask this question. And, I have a, <laughs> and, and here's the thing. I have a wildly controversial approach to this as, as I do with most things. You know what? It's rarely about the tech. It's about the person using it. I have seen multiple... And I'll, I'll name check a couple if that's okay. Do you think Workday is a good good solution then? <laughs> if I have a desperate desire to input all of my resume data twice, it is the perfect solution. <laughs> I love that answer. If, if, if I want to go through a hiring process where I need to put two sets of, of, of stuff in, absolutely, that's the one I would choose. Mm. Let me name check a couple. Um, things like Lucia, for example. Things like uh, Rocket Reach. Um, mm, I love Rocket stuff. Reach. Yeah. Your results may vary. I think that's the thing. I think we ask that question because what we're interested in is what's something that, you know, and again, it comes back to what's something that they don't want you to know. Sometimes those ones work. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're yeah. great. In some markets, they work much better. In America, absolutely. In Europe, most likely. In Australia, it can be mm. difficult to get the, da the data that's required. Yeah. So, I mean, I was talking to a, a key player and who, who I certainly, you know, respect and who I think I've mentioned his name once or twice in another podcast, but Dan was saying, you know, he has a couple of different versions of it. And I thought if someone like who's been doing this for decades doesn't have one magic bullet, he has two to three to four magic bullets, mm. that in itself, and again, if, if that is supposed to be how things are segmented, then that is, it shows you that I don't feel that there is going to be one magic, you know, wand waving. It is always about the person using it. It's not about the tech. Spot on with that. And I think, you know, the, the same thing goes for even having ATSs. They say you're, you're as good as the data that you put in into the system or how you use it. Steve, just very conscious of time. We could go on and talk about this, but I'm really glad our paths crossed and I'm so excited to see what else you're going to do for our community. You absolutely should be speaking at SOSU. So gear up for that because your name is going to get thrown in there. I totally appreciate you coming onto the podcast, sharing your findings, your experience, your thought process. We all love a bit of controversy. Why not throw it in there? Really appreciate your time. And thank you so much for coming onto the Crafty Saucer. Thank you so much. And please, people, Send me your disagreements, send me your hate, send me your agreement, whatever. I'm on LinkedIn. You should all know how to find me. I'm sure Denise will put all my profile links in, but, but absolutely, I, I love having discussions like this. So thank you so much. And he will not block you. I can promise you that. He definitely won't. He's always geared up for a good discussion. So once again, Steve, thank you so much. And everyone stay crafty. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode. And we'll be back next week with another exciting episode. If you found this valuable, don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. That helps others find the show and we greatly appreciate it. Once again, happy sourcing and stay crafty. Until next time.